Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Scoliosis, it's an abnormal sideways curvature of the spine. And if you have a child with scoliosis, the curve and the curve is moderately large. Traditional treatments have been either bracing or if the curve progresses too much, surgery. And the most common type of scoliosis surgery is called spinal fusion. Surgeons connect two or more of the bones of the spine, the vertebrae, together so that they can't move. And that does straighten the spine, but it has some lifelong consequences in addition to limiting the motion of the spine. I'm not a surgeon, but it doesn't sound good. No, it isn't one you want to have. Right. Now, for some patients, there's an alternative to fusing the spine for severe scoliosis. It's called a tether implant. And joining us in studio to talk about scoliosis and the new procedure is Mayo Clinic orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Todd Milbrandt. Welcome to the program. Thanks for the invitation. I really appreciate being able to talk about this and any other pediatric issue for us in orthopedics. So uh, tell our audience, uh, you haven't been at the Mayo Clinic forever. You came from somewhere else and yeah, were I recruited am. here. So that's how good he is. <laughs> right. well, I'm a foreign man, for, in a foreign land. I started here five years ago. Before that, I worked at the Shriners Hospital in Lexington, Kentucky for about 10 years. So um, lots of uh, great things about both places, but I appreciate being able to work here. My family has settled here, so it's been a it's been a good fit for if us. If your wife is happy here, you got to yeah, be. I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so let's talk about scoliosis. It, we we describe the fact that it's a curvature of the spine, a sideways mm-hmm. curvature of the spine. Why does that happen? Yeah, so that's a really good question, uh, Dr. Shives. For us, we actually don't know. There's lots of investigation going on into the genetics of what causes scoliosis people try we know that it's not one gene if it were one gene it'd be easy to figure out and we would have figured it out already more than likely it is a complex sets of genes and maybe even uh, different types of those complex genes within different racial types may uh, may may have some influence on why scoliosis occurs um but we do know that it is genetic because it does tend to run in families. Um, uh, even if uh, the child that we're seeing has a moderate curve, if they look through their entire family history or other people, aunt, cousins, far second, first cousins, they'll find someone usually that has a scoliosis within it. And so this is not usually a spontaneous mutation. It tends to follow in, in families. I thought that would be because it's just so common. I mean, for me, I always just heard, you know, the kids, we would get tested and, oh, you're a taller girl. Mm-hmm. So that's why you have scoliosis. Yeah, no, <laughs> it really is because your aunt or uncle or your one of your parents, clearly one of your parents, mm-hmm. carried some genetic factor that then would convey that to you. Uh, we do. We did a good job in the 60s, 70s, and 80s of doing screening. Um, and then in the, in the kind of the mid-90s, early 2000s, the cost of those screening uh, procedures uh, was kind of weighed against the benefit. And unfortunately for us in pediatric orthopedics, that meant that the school nurse was is no longer a part of the school systems. And so now our universal screening that happened pretty much all the way across the United States does not uh, really happen anymore. So we rely more on our primary care physicians to try and do that. Um, but it's not the same as lining everybody up in a gym and having the school nurse uh, look f- at their back for scoliosis. And so I think we that don't do that anymore. No. Mm-mm. Good uh, old days, Tom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Even here in Olmstead County, where we live here at Mayo Clinic, they no longer do that. Now, there are some uh, patients who have scoliosis that could be caused by something else, uh, mm-hmm. a birth defect, correct? Or that's you right. can have it with muscular dystrophy or cerebral palsy, but that's unusual. That's correct. And uh, what we were talking about is what the click category of, if you look it up on the internet called idiopathic scoliosis Meaning we, don't know. we don't know <laughs> and uh the but there are specific reasons why some people get them those that you mentioned plus there could be abnormal abnormalities within the bones themselves some people are born with instead of blocks for their vertebra they're born with triangles and blocks for their vertebra uh in addition they could potentially have something wrong with their spinal cord itself uh, these are of the, though of the grand majority those are in the one to two percent of the kids who have scoliosis the grand majority of the these kids have what we would call idiopathic scoliosis. The school nurse made me believe what I mentioned earlier, that it's more likely females than males that have this. Is that true? That is true. It's usually seven to one females to male. 
Uh, and so, uh, you know, our scoliosis clinics that we uh, take care of really uh, are full of teenage girls. And so that's who we really care for. Um, although boys can get it, um, sometimes the boys are, if you look at their results, they are stiffer to brace, meaning they are tougher to brace. And also uh, their surgery is a little bit less corrective and a little bit more, um, we lose a little bit more blood. Um, so they are, they are a different entity altogether. And are taller children more likely to get it than shorter children? I'm not so sure that I know of an association between tall or short. Okay. Um, at all. all right. No more school nurses uh, yep. to check these kids. So every parent out there who is listening or watching should check their child. That's right. right. And, and what, what are they looking for? So the easiest way to do it is um, is look at them in a bathing suit. Uh, you look for their shoulder asymmetry. So when you stand uh, and you look at their back, you say, is one shoulder very much higher than the other shoulder? That's a one sign. The other sign could be if you ask them to bend over, you can look for a prominence within their ribs, meaning they look like they have a rib hump compared to the other side. It's very hard really to look at the back of a child and trace out if they have scoliosis or a curvature that way. So instead, what we do is we look at the three-dimensional twist that also occurs at the same time with scoliosis. Do children grow out of scoliosis? No. So once they have it, that will be the curve they will have forever. There are some kids who will take an x-ray and they lean one way and it's a little bit sagged and then you take an x-ray six months later because you're worried about a scoliosis and then they're straight. I'm not sure that they actually ever had scoliosis and that they were just being a wiggle worm when they had their x-ray taken. <laughs> and why is it important to, to discover whether or not your child has scoliosis? What are the complications if untreated? So the I think the key part is early discovery allows us some options treatment options that late discovery may not and so that's why I think it's important to do it when the child is pre-adolescent um, so a brace doesn't work when you are all done growing for example um, this tether surgery which we will talk about again does not really work unless the child has growth remaining if we let a scoliosis just occur and get large and then the child continues to live their adult life the consequences of that are that that curve will continue to worsen if the curve measures 50 degrees or more really? throughout the rest of their life. They'll add on one to two degrees per year for every year that they live. And, you know, we're talking about 18 year old children, so they have a long life to live. And because of that, a large amount of progression could be possible. And so what is the consequence of that? Well, once the curves get in the 100 degree range, then you can start to see cardio and pulmonary issues with that. So but it presses heart and lung problems. That's right. It, it does do that, but only with the really large curves. More than likely, though, if you have a 100 degree curve and you try and wear any amount of normal Western clothing, you will look significantly deformed. And so I think that some of this is the fact that we live in a Western society um, and that if you allow a curve to get very, very large, it will be hard to be accepted that way. So if you catch it relatively early, you can hopefully avoid surgery. So that means bracing? Yeah, so that our first line of treatment for any child with uh, spinal curvature greater than 20 degrees, uh, and the degrees is measured on an x-ray, how much tilt there actually is, um, is a brace. Uh, the, the good news about the brace is that it's very effective. A large randomized control trial that went through the United States proved that the brace works about 75% of the time. The hard part is that the child actually has to wear it, yeah, right? And, it, yeah, and if you no know fun. teenage people or children, that is Girl. a very, girls, <laughs> that is a very difficult um, uh, sell sometimes. And they have to wear it a lot. They have to wear it 16 to 18 hours a day, and they have to wear it seven days a week. And it doesn't cure the scoliosis. It just hopefully prevents it from the curve from getting worse. That is absolutely correct. So our goal with our bracing is that we keep that small curve, a, sm a small curve, and do not allow it to get into the surgical range, which we would consider over 50 degrees. All right. Our guest is Mayo Clinic pediatric orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Todd Milbrandt. We've been talking about scoliosis. Time for a short break. When we come back, we'll talk about additional treatment, particularly surgery and a new device called a tether, which might be a huge advantage for some young children.
Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Our guest, pediatric orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Todd Milbrandt. We've been talking about scoliosis. The most common form is idiopathic, meaning we don't know what causes it. We've talked about the conservative option of bracing. It's a little bit uh, difficult because these are teenagers. Most of them are girls, and they got to wear the thing practically full time. And if that doesn't work, if the curve progresses despite conservative measures, what's next? Yeah, so in the past, I would say before um, we knew about this new procedure, the only option were, was to wait it out until it got to be a larger curve and then do a fusion operation. And that was really the only card we had left to play with these kids. And a fusion operation basically definitely corrects the scoliosis to straight, but then takes away all the movement of the spine over the segments that we have to fuse. Now, how, tell us about that operation. How long does it take? I mean, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Usually a six to eight hour surgery um, with four to five days as inpatient. Um, and uh, it does, in, unfortunately, it's relatively painful for these kids, but they do get over it. Um, I'm not going to say that there are, that it's a disaster, but it is a risky operation. Um, but, uh, but most kids come out of it on the other side. However, it, I think the hardest part for us and the, and the hardest part for the families to understand is that it's irreversible. So we fuse this spine into a straight position those vertebral segments won't ever move again. And so that's the, for the families that really sought us out uh, to try and come up with alternatives, um, that was what they were the most disturbed about, was the fact that, yeah, they're great that their spine is straight, but the fact that they now uh, can't move as well as they did before was disturbing to them. For the okay. rest of their life. Yeah. yeah. Eesh. Two questions. How do you get the vertebrae to fuse to knit together? Yep. And how do you get the spine straight? So the way we do those operations is that we use uh, surgical um, intraoperative navigation. So we use a CT scan that's uh, obtained uh, with the patient asleep. Then we use what looks like um, uh, we have special tools that then allow us to coordinate placing the pedicle screws, which are screws that go into those vertebral bodies so that we miss all of the most important parts of the the, uh, so the pedicles are on both sides of the spinal cord. That's so right. you don't want to miss. Don't want to miss. And you also, the aorta's up front, so you don't want to miss that either. <laughs> this is so, making me a little uncomfortable, but continue <laughs> right. on. So, so we place those. Many times there are two to three millimeters in width. They all, this uh, surgical navigation allows us to do that. We then connect these vertebral screws together with a solid metal rod. That rod, in general, is usually anywhere between 5.5 millimeters in width to 6.0 millimeters in width. So this, I mean, it's a regularly it's like a uh, a very large rod that we would use Is and you jack up the concave side of the curb that's right so to try and pull it to a straighter position is this generally in the by the shoulders and the low back and the neck? Where do you usually perform this? So we have to use we ha we perform it wherever it's needed. And so many there are lots of different flavors for scoliosis. Sometimes they're in the chest. Sometimes they're in the low back. Sometimes, unfortunately, they're in both of those places. So, so double curve. Double curve. And if it, they're big double curve, then you end up having to fuse the entirety of the spine. I know somebody who's in that camp. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> You had a double curve? I've, it corrects itself. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> but that's why I was asking all these because they said, oh, it's just a slight. You'll grow out mm -hmm. of it. I mean, I think that's what the thinking was mm -hmm. in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. Probably not any longer. Right. Okay, tell me about this tether surgery. Yeah, so the the thing, you know, uh, the my, one of my favorite parts about the Mayo Clinic are is the is our credo is we take um, you know the patients always come first, and so our one of our patients uh, was uh, had a scoliosis um, large enough where they were looking at a fusion operation should they wait a little bit longer and they didn't want to wait any longer and they weren't tolerating the brace anymore so, so now we're talking about a, a curve that's 50 degrees or greater that's huh? well actually she was in the 45 degree okay. but she still had time remaining in her growth so more than likely she was going to hit that 50 degree mark and she didn't like the brace or the brace like, wasn't working or that's right that's a big curve and she, this child was also a um an athlete and wanted to be able to return and do all of those athletic things that she would like to do and with a fused spine it's difficult to do it's difficult i mean some of our kids can do them but if you go top to bottom um it becomes very difficult so she came to us and she actually had said um i want a vertebral body tether i want a tether surgery and she said um well, and we said, she we learned about that well 
the internet. kids on the internet <laughs> uh-huh. figure it all out. So mm-hmm. uh, she actually went to the place that was doing it at the time and then came back and says, I, we learned about it, but we want you and Dr. Larson to perform the case. It's one of our colleagues. It's one of my <laughs> surgical colleagues that we do all these cases together, another pediatric orthopedic surgeon. So mm-hmm. we learned about it. We practiced. We had... Um, we practice on some cadavers, other cadavers, yep, yeah. and we set it all up, and we were confident we could do it in a safe way, and we did our first one now almost four years ago. Really? We, we waited an entire year to make sure that she did well and everything was fine, and then we started our program here, and that includes a, uh, a study with the FDA, so we started our own FDA study to, to make sure that we were doing it all correctly, make sure that we were sending them information so they knew what we were doing, and then once we that started, we have now done 45 tethers um, uh, in the past four years. All right. Now tell us what you mean by a tether. How does this thing work? Yeah. So it's a kind of an interesting concept. We take, uh, we place the vertebral body screws. So in the front, we place a camera in the chest. We look in the chest and we find the vertebral body. We then place screws into those vertebral bodies and we literally connect those screws with what looks like a climbing rope. It is a clearly a medical grade uh, braided soft rope, but cables, by cables, cable, basically cable, yeah. cable. And by doing that, we tighten it on the side that is the convexity or the far side of the curve. And by doing that, we then straighten the curve. Um, and by doing that, <laughs> Charles is asleep. I know. <laughs> and I know, but it's making that, me sit up straighter. I know. <laughs> and by doing that, we can take advantage of growth in these kids because if we put pressure on the high side and decrease pressure on the low side of the scoliosis, the child scoliosis will actually continue to correct over time as they grow. When do most kids kids quit growing? So um, on average, boys, it's 16, and on girls, it's 15. Okay. Have you seen any complications? So there have been a few complications, uh, and a little bit of extra fluid around the chest, um, which required just uh, 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 an aspiration of that. And oh, so around the lungs, around some the fluid lungs, collected? That's right. Okay. Fluid collection, we were able to take that out. Thank you. Not um, a big deal. Not a big deal. And we have not had any neuromonitoring changes or anything problematic with our spinal cord. Do you take <sighs> the tether out when they're done growing? That's a great question. Um, it's a very large surgery, and so most of the time we leave it in. We know that more than likely this will break over time because it is a rope across mo- motion segments. But by taking advantage of growth, we will change the vertebra from being wedged at the apex to now being squares. So then the tether is no longer needed because they will have grown into a straight position, and then the tether will break and that will be okay so the the curve corrects itself over time because of the the tether that's tension. right so tension. retention yeah. on one side and then by growth it's kind of like staking a tomato plant you turn it into you kind of grow it into the right position and that way it grows straight do you Perfect. ever over correct i mean did you make it too tight <laughs> yeah so that is one of the other complications uh, that has been described is that we make it too tight and they have too much growth remaining and it actually takes the curve from one side and puts it onto the other side and but so they keep, they keep their motion. They keep their all, motion when, when they over. do that, and we can we go we've gone in and cut the tether uh, if they had have had any overcorrection. We've had one overcorrection. And Big cable mu- cutters? Oh. Uh, no. <laughs> now we, now we have to use our camera. How oh. is that patient one doing? Oh, he's doing very mm-hmm. well. Actually, she went back and uh, performed her high school uh, sport, and now has gone on to college. Great. Wow. Pediatric orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Todd Milbrandt. Scoliosis, an abnormal sideways curvature of the spine. Fortunately, most curves are relatively mild and don't require treatment. Bigger curves and those that progress may require treatment. The conservative management is bracing, although it's difficult to get an adolescent girl to wear that brace 24 hours a day. Uh, If the curve progresses surgery may be an option and it's always in the past been fusion but now you've got this new operation called the tether That's sounds right. fantastic thank you dr for todd milbrandt thanks so much for being with us thank you for letting me talk about it appreciate it